Okay. Good morning. It's time to begin our service today. I want to greet everyone in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glad to see you come out for this celebration of life for Brother Richard Clark. Uh, what a man of God. Amen. Amen. I have a scripture I would like to begin with. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's pray. Heavenly Fathers, we come before you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the life of Brother Richard Clark. We thank you for what he meant to all of us, especially here in this church, but his family more than anyone else. What a tremendous impact he has played on all of our lives. We ask for your Holy Spirit to bring comfort. We know your word has brought comfort already because we know where he's at. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We take great comfort and solace in knowing that. We also know you said you wouldn't leave us comfortless, but you would send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, especially for times like this, to comfort our hearts. I pray it. Holy Spirit, do the work that only you can do in the hearts that those are grieving. Though we're rejoicing in the knowledge we have, there is an emptiness in our heart for someone that we've said goodbye to. We just ask this all in the lovely name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We would like to do a song for you in the beginning. The title of it is I'll Fly Away. But before we sing it, I'd like to read a couple of psalms dealing with this particular subject. Psalms 90, verse 10. The Bible says this, the days of our years are three score and ten. Seventy years is a basic life, the average. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, Brother Richard passed that four score years. Amen? Yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Well, what do we fly away to? Psalms 55 answers it for us in verse 6. David speaking here, the sweet psalmist of Israel. And I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove. For then would I fly away. And be at rest. Brother Richard is resting today. He's at that place of rest in Jesus. And with that, we're going to sing the old song, I'll fly away. Some glad morning, when this life is o'er, I'll fly away. To a home on God's celestial shore, I'll fly away. As we sing this song, think of Brother Richard today. Amen. Pastor Rick.
It is a celebration. Pastor Arlen was right. Brother Richard, he knew. He knew there was going to be a celebration in heaven. I can only imagine the church service that's going on, Sister Ruth Ann. We love you. Thank you for singing that with us. You can be seated. I'm sorry. Amen. There are two words that come to mind when I think of Brother Richard. The first one is a legacy. What a legacy he is leaving behind for so many. And it's because of another word, integrity. Those are two things I think about. A man of integrity, a man of his word, and a man who leaves behind a legacy, a man of God. I don't know if you noticed in our text in the beginning, but it said that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Brother Richard was truly a man of God. I've heard it many times. People say he was truly a man of God. What, what a legacy. Now, the, both of them stand out because they're both rooted in the relationship he had with Jesus Christ. That's why we say that he was a man of God, because what came out of him was through Jesus Christ. Not because of what he was, but because of Jesus in him and him allowing Jesus to work through him. And church, we all need to learn some lessons here to let Christ work through us because if we do, if we live a life of integrity, we will live behind a legacy and we'll be declared the same as a woman or a man of God. What a tribute, I think, is the greatest thing you can say about a person. Richard would follow the teachings of the Word of God and he would also follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. And I guarantee you, if you'll follow the teaching of God's holy word and be led by the Holy Spirit, when you pass from this life, other people will say, what a man or a woman of God. It's that simple. And he lived it to the fullest. A life without reproach. A man of God. It's not a title that he gave to himself. And I've heard it several times this week already. I don't even know if the people understood what they were saying, but they would say, what a man of God. When his name would come up, they would say, what a man of God. What a man of God. I'd like to share one of his favorite scriptures for you before I go on. Many of you may remember, maybe you don't. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 8, the Bible says this, For bodily exercise profiteth little. <laughs> that was his favorite scripture. I don't know how many times he quoted that scripture. The conversation would start, some would say, well, I'm on this diet, or I'm on this, and I'm doing this exercise program, and I'm doing this, and he's always in. Bodily exercise profiteth little. But if you finish that scripture, it is a profound statement. Notice what the Bible says. But, 
Now, bodily exercise is profit, isn't it? It does profit some, a little. You might gain a year or two, maybe. So there is some profit in it. But what should we focus on more? And this is what Brother Richard decided to focus on. But godliness is profitable unto all things. Bodily exercise profit is for some small things, a little bit about your health. It might help you out a little bit. But godliness, exercising that, profits all things. Having promise of life that is now. In other words, it's a good thing to exercise spiritual things for your health now because then you won't be worried about everything. If you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, when calamities come to your life, and they will, when difficulties come to your life, they will, you won't be stressed out like so many other people are. Stress is one of the number one killers there is. But because he had learned to put his faith and trust and hope in God, I watched many times in Brother Richard's life, something would happen. Sister Ruth, my, Ruth Ann may get really upset, but he was kind of even keel. And he would kind of keep her. <laughs> Almost even keel. Amen. He understood this. But the most important thing, not only is it good in this life to practice read the word godliness but also and it ends and of that which is to come in other words the life that is to come because he practiced godliness he put his faith in Jesus Christ not only was he better off in this life for it but now he's as healthy as you can get you there's not an exercise program anywhere that can even compare to what he's experiencing right now but integrity. Integrity is the quality of being honest and having a strong moral principle, a moral uprightness. In other words, there are certain things you stand for, but not only do you stand for them, you live them. You practice what you preach. And we all know that Brother Rick, he practiced what he preached. He not only believed these things, but he lived those things. And that's why he's called a man of God. I can just tell you straight up. He was so careful not to bring a reproach on the gospel that it even influenced his driving. Now, when we first met Ruth Ann and Richard, being the gracious people that they are, we would go out on Friday nights many times and to the Cracker Barrel in Bradenton, and uh, Richard said, well, I'll pick you up. Now, I remember the first time he came and picked us up. I'm thinking, you know, I've read with some, I've rode with some of these 80 year old guys <laughs> and gals, you know what I'm saying? Mid 70s, you know, and whew, a little nervous. He was driving all the way to Braden and on the interstate. And I didn't know him that well. But within a mile, I was totally relaxed. He was an excellent driver. I mean, he drove better than some young people I know. Very alert. I never once found myself pumping the other pedal, you know, how you do. Just absolutely at ease riding with him. Going and coming. Even after it was dark, he was an excellent driver. I have ridden with some of you. I won't mention any names. But you will keep someone's prayer life constant, like the Bible says, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. <laughs> get in the car and you start praying the moment they start driving. And you don't stop until they get you back home. And then the next time they call you, another scripture comes to mind. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. <laughs> but Richard wasn't like that. He really wasn't. He was a very good driver. And I remember there were times when they would still go back to New York during the summer months. And I'm told that they would get on F-75 and he would set his, what do you call that thing, cruise control on 70 and never go above it. Never exceeds 70 miles an hour. All the way from Sun City to New York. Not once would he break the speed limit. You might say, well, what's the big deal? Because he wanted to be a good witness. He was a man of integrity and he didn't want someone sitting him on the side of the road with a state trooper writing license. Well, there's Brother Richard. Caught speeding. It meant a lot to him. 
It really did. And I think it reflected to all of us the kind of man that he was. Another thing I can tell you, and I'm not going to share everything because was, there's many that want to share today. And uh, you'll probably come from a different angle, but we may repeat some things, I'm sure. And, uh, but that's okay. He's worthy of it. But I can tell you, he was not a yes man. You know, a lot of pastors, they like league yes men. They'll just tell them what they want to hear or do what they want to do. Richard was not that kind of man. As one of the board of directors at this church, he didn't go along just to get along. He was there for a reason. And he was there with his convictions. And he would speak his convictions, his mind and his heart. Not mean, but he had some tone to it. He knew what he believed and why he believed it. And I appreciate that. And I probably appreciate it more now than I even did then. Because now I realize that he walked many a mile serving Jesus Christ. And he had more wisdom than I even realized at that particular time. So he was a man of principle. He was a man of his word. He'd been around the block a few times. He loved the word of God. You can tell by his old Bible here. It didn't just sit on the table anywhere. But he poured his life and his heart into it, reading and studying it. For many years, he and Gary Dunlap had a Bible study next door. They called it the round table, even though it was rectangle. But very successful Bible study. A lot of people attended it for many, many years until Richard's health got to the place where he just couldn't do it anymore. But he loved the Word of God. He had a knowledge of the Word of God. And I've talked to many of you that were able to go to that round table he received a lot from Brother Richard and the Word. He treated Sister Ruth Ann like a princess. Matter of fact, she referred to herself as princess. And sometimes we would leave Cracker Barrel and she would make the statement, we've got to get home before midnight or I'll turn to a pumpkin. <laughs> 68 years. God bless you. Penny and I just celebrated our 50th. I thought that was a big deal, but 68 years. Wow. Wow. Shows us how important it was to him. I've met a lot of people over the past 27 years, literally thousands. I could say that. I have met thousands of people in the past 27 years. But I can honestly say that very few have impacted my life and this church as much is Brother Richard Clark. And that's an honor. And those of you who know, you know it's true what I'm saying. Out of, out of thousands of people, he was one of those kind of guys that didn't just come in to float around. He was busy about his father's work. He wanted to be a part of the kingdom. You could trust him because he was a man of his word. He came to me one time and he says, I got a, a proposition for you. I said, what's that, Brother Richard? He said, I want to put vinyl siding on the, the modular building, the fellowship hall. But I have two requests. And I'll do it under two circumstances. If you can meet these circumstances or these requests, then I'll do it. I said, well, what is that? He said, the church supply all the material. I thought, well, that's reasonable. Absolutely. He said, and I work alone. I thought, wow, Brother Richard, that's quite an undertaking. That's a pretty good-sized building. It, the walls are 10 feet tall. A lot of work's going to have to be done off of ladders. He said, the condition is I have to be alone. I have to work alone. You buy the material, and I'll do it. And I remember thinking, wow, that doesn't seem fair for him to do the whole building. I thought, but, you know, he's an old man. He'll get started and get tired. And he'll have to ask for help. And. He never did. He did that whole building, every single piece by himself. And he did a very good job at it, too. He was quite a craftsman and a carpenter. You know, I mentioned he was not only a man of integrity, but he left behind a legacy. And legacy is something that you do leave behind. Matter of fact, a will can be considered a legacy. Property can be considered a a legacy, but he left behind something much greater than tangible things. His legacy touches all of our hearts, and especially his children. I guarantee you, when he passed away, 
They weren't concerned about, what did dad leave us? Well, what's the most important thing I can get? What did he leave me? What was most important is what he left in their hearts, in their lives. I'm not saying we can't distribute things that were our parents. But I've seen families fall apart over these things. But the most important thing is what did he leave inside of me? What did he leave inside of me? Much greater than material possessions. The most important thing I believe, I know when I die, I hope my legacy is that was a man of God. I mean, that's my prayer. That was a man of God. It means so much. One of the things that Brother Richard was most proud of, of course, was Ruth Ann and his children. You guys were a trophy to your dad. I don't know how many times he would tell people, all my children know Jesus. Now, that's, that's a big thing. I can't say that. Very few people can say, all my children have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it was like a trophy. And it well should be a trophy. They had seen the power of God to change their dad's life. And they experienced it in their own lives. And I guarantee you that was one of his most, most proudest things in his life. That you guys know Jesus. That meant more. And Ruth Ann too. Amen. She had a part to play. <laughs> Amen. It speaks volumes of the man, not that he was, but the man that he is. I kind of feel like John the Baptist today. He felt like he wasn't worthy to loose Jesus' shoes. Remember? I'm not even worthy to unlatch your shoes, Jesus. You want me to, to baptize you? And I stand here today thinking, I don't even feel worthy of of being able to speak in honor of this man. I'm honored to do so, grateful to do so. And I was thinking, about if I could be half the man of God that, that Richard was, I would be a happy man if I could just be half of what he is. But I want to leave you with the words of the Apostle Paul. We don't sorrow as those who have no hope. We don't sorrow like the world when someone passes away and all they have is grief knowing they'll never ever see their loved one again. We don't sorrow like that. We know we have a hope in our heart that they're fine and well right now. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He's with them right now. But we also know Jesus is bringing them back and we will be reunited once again. What a glorious day that's going to be. What a glorious day. Pastor Rick's going to come sing that song for you. Oh, glorious day. Give him your attention, please.
stone roll away from the door. Then he arose over death he had come. Now he's ascended, my Lord evermore. Death could not hold him, the grave could not keep. What a glorious day when Jesus comes back to take us all home. Amen? Amen. Amen. I know there are several here that would like to say something today in honor of Brother Richard. I know his children have some things to say. I want to open the mic up. I know it can be very difficult at times to get up in front of people if you're not used to it. But I also know there's this awkward moments because the Holy Spirit's dealing with some of us. I want to make, there'll be a little pause in between here and there, but those of you who would like to come share, please come at this time. Anybody want to be first? Okay. Please use the mic. I just want to share a quick story. It's uh, wonderful to be part of this celebration for Brother Richard. And uh, he was always supportive. He was always there when we were in the softball days and what have you. And I just want to share a funny story. Um, not long ago, Brother Rick had mentioned, hey, we, we need to come and get the, the couch out and make room for a hospice bed for Brother Richard. And even in these last few weeks, he had a moment with me when I walked in. I wasn't sure if he could tell who I was. I kind of felt later on that, the God, that God gave me the answer because I looked at him and said, hey, Brother Richard, it's good to see you. Uh, I'm glad to be here and helping the family. And I said, would you believe it? They've made me a pastor at church. And he goes, Really? <laughs> I love that man he was like that every time he was with me so I'm grateful to have known him uh, in the time we were definitely a, a traditional circus family for a long time so we'd only get a little bit of Richard when we'd be here and I'm grateful for the time that God gave me to know him so that's all I have God bless you I've been saying that too really? <laughs> guess I'll go first since I'm already up here, but uh, see if I can get through it. Happy Lord. Having been kind of the black sheep of the family for quite a while, I was probably the last one to get saved. And uh, geez, I'll never, never forget that night. <laughs> but Bless you, Lord. I tried hard just to sit there. I thought, no way am I going up. I'm not doing it not doing it and uh, well 
I went up. Couldn't sit there, but uh, my dad did touch a lot of lives. He touched mine. <laughs> Several times when I was younger, probably more than I'd like, but uh, he was. And I'm just so glad we moved here when we did and got to spend the last nine years with him. Amen. And uh, we were going to wait till we retired, but we would have missed a lot if we did. So we came down when we did and were able to spend a lot of time with him and mom. So I'm just grateful for that. Thank you. Amen. First of all, I thank all of you for coming. I know that it uh, would mean a lot to Dad. And I'm, uh, if you don't know me, I'm Rich Murthan's oldest son. I'm the best-looking son. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I'm the favorite. I don't know if you don't all knew that, just so you're aware. Uh, you know, I think of a lot of things when I think of my dad. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that, I, that really sticks in my mind is how much he worked. You know, when I was a kid, he, he was always working. If it wasn't at his, his regular job, he would come home. He would uh, w work on the house. We bought this little farmhouse, had it been lived in for 10 years, and Dad remodeled the whole thing. Uh, we wanted to build a stable for the horses, and we didn't have any money, so Dad was out there with a pick and a shovel, digging the footers for this barn, poured the concrete, built the whole thing. A lot of times by himself, you know, he just, he did like to work by himself. But I love, but the times that I did work with Dad, I just loved doing it. And uh, there was a couple of times, a couple of things that stand out in my mind as I, when I worked with him. And he had to, you know, Dad had a good sense of humor, but he was very sharp. And you had to get, kind of get the upper hand sometimes and see the opportunity for a good time, for a joke. Well, I remember one time Dad was out fixing fence out behind the barn and I walked into the barn and I saw him way out there maybe 200 yards out in the pasture and that was an electric fence and I looked over at the charger and it was unplugged and I thought here's a shot you know here's my opportunity so I plugged the fence in and I'm watching and dad reached down and he grabbed a piece of wire and all of a sudden he jumped back and you could tell he was looking like what in the world I unplugged this fence and he looked back at me, and there I am standing, just bent over, laughing at him. Because I knew I had, a, there was enough of a distance there, he couldn't catch me. You know, I had a good head start, too. So, and, uh, but, you, you know, after he got over the initial shock, I think he saw the humor in that, too. But not only was he a hard worker, I mean, he had a good work ethic, and I think he instilled that in, uh, in my brother and in my sister. And uh, he would do things like, I remember, you know, he was a garbage man. And I remember working with him one time. We used to pick up garbage at the at this shopping plaza. This was days before malls and days before they had containers and dumpsters. And this particular store had just what they called the garbage room. And it was about 10 feet wide and about 20 feet long. And we'd back up to the doors in this garbage room. And he had, had to stand back when he opened those doors because the stuff would just come out on top of you. There was that much in there. And we would take oh, a whole truckload of stuff out of there. And at the end... You know, I'm thinking, okay, this is good enough. We got, we got a truckload. Let's get out of here. Let's go to the dump and get rid of this stuff. Dad would take a, a piece of cardboard, and he'd kind of scrape the floor up into a box and, and throw it in the truck. You know, he had to leave that looking good, even though we knew in two days we were going to come back and it's going to be full again. But that was just kind of the work ethic that Dad had. We were in business for a little while. We had a backhoe. Is we bought this old backhoe to, to we were building pole barns and stuff and one day it was the middle of winter and there's snow and ice out there and we pulled the backhoe up to the to the garage door and we were doing some work on it and I was up in the garage doing something and all of a sudden I hear this horrible noise this bang crash and I'm I look out there and there's dad laying on the ground the ladder on top of him and I said what are you doing oh I said I'm trying to fix that pin up there he had to weld or he's going to weld something up there and, and I just walked over to the backhoe, and I just grabbed one of the levers, pushed it down, this thing came, dropped down, this, this thing he was wanting to work on, I was like right there at eye level. And I'm thinking, you know, why did you do that, Dad? You know, you were, he's so smart. How did you not see that this was the correct way to do this? But, um, you know, he was smart. And he, one of his favorite sayings was, I thought I was wrong once, but I was mistaken. 
and uh, you know he, there was a lot there was a lot to that um, but the other thing in addition to to his work ethic that he instilled in me was love and uh, love for my mom and uh, love for the Lord and uh, for that I just say thanks dad Amen, brother. Thank you. As my great grandfather would have said, I want to do this about as much as I want to eat a rhubarb sandwich. But <laughs> uh, if you don't know me, I'm Jan. I'm the youngest and the only girl. I wasn't spoiled at all. Um, at least I think I'm their child. My brothers told me all growing up that I was adopted. <laughs> and that the police left me on the doorstep. They were real sweet like that. Um, my dad was my hero. He made it real hard when it came time to find a husband. Because they had really big shoes to fill. And... Uh, Bruce was a little iffy there for a while, but he's really caught on. Um, my dad uh, was the one who fixed everything. I mean, if there was ever a problem, dad fixed it. And uh, be it in the house or be it, you know, kid problems or, you know, we, we just went to dad. That was just what you did. You went to dad, and dad always had an answer. So, I don't know where I'm going now, but um, to the Lord. The Lord's going to be there. And uh, going to miss him a lot. Love you, dad. Thank you, Jesus. Probably nobody in this room knows me other than the uh, immediate family. Um, 1980, my wife and I accepted the Lord in a little, uh, really small church. And uh, the first Bible study I went to was led by Rich Clark. We went down in their cellar. I never knew what a Bible study was. I never opened the Bible. I never did any of that stuff. And he was absolutely phenomenal. He became a guy that being a coach and a teacher all the years with me everything was about winning but little did i know that you can never be a winner if you don't have jesus christ on your team and uh so the relationship with rich continued to grow we both lived up in horseheads he moved to elmira we moved to elmira one street away from him and then when they moved to florida i said well we'll probably never see him again and uh Sure enough, he came to Sun City. We build a house in Apollo Beach. We're at exit 246, and he's at, I believe it's 240, I'm not sure. So the relationship continued. And uh, Rich was the type of guy, uh, like I said, being a coach and a people person, uh, that, that if you didn't like Rich Clark, you probably should go seek some counseling. Because he probably was the most honest, upbeat person that I ever met and uh, he was always there for you he had a great sense of humor and he had the ability to laugh at himself like everything that w has been said in here uh, by his kids and I believe Arlen is that would be right on the money is somebody that I've seen that all my life with Rich he is a people person and he just loved people and there's certain type of people that you like to be around and Rich is one of them. He, you always like to be there, except sometimes when he was on a golf course. He used to hit the balls all over the place. But, but anyway, um, tremendous family. And one side note, uh, Jan just talked about her husband. This, I wasn't going to say anything about this, but Bruce sitting there. They live in Texas. I had him as a student in junior high. He was one of our all-time great football players in Elmira, New York, won the Ernie Davis Award all kinds of stuff and the Lord sure made sure that she got a winner with Bruce 
And it's amazing how the Lord works when you got a praying father, when he's sitting at the top, and the Lord's taking care of everybody in the family. And to say that every person in that family is a Christian, and there's a lot of kids and a lot of people in there, and uh, the Lord changed a lot of the lives in that family. And uh, I can honestly say that uh, most guys have trouble. Flippantly, you say somebody, well, I love Ireland. I don't, I don't even know you, Ireland, but I, I might say, I love Ireland. I loved Rich Clark. And guys usually don't say that about another person, and especially somebody like me. If I tell somebody I love them, man, they're first class, and he's right up there. You got the Lord, and then there's Rich. And uh, so you, you lost a great one, but the Lord got a, Lord got a great one too. And uh, so anyway, just thank you. And uh, I apologize for coming up here, really, that nobody knows me, but I had to say this because I like to talk. So <laughs> see you later. Thank you, brother. favorite son-in-law I'm the son-in-law I'm not blood but I'm almost there and uh, I, I really know that that I I am the favorite so sorry Jim but I was the baby I last I lost my dad when I was a young guy and I was fortunate to have people pour into my life like coach Emick Coach was one of my role models growing up, and, uh, and then we even worked together in high school, and, and he was still a role model. So I love you, Coach. Thank you for those words, and uh, you've always been a blessing to me. And uh, like, like Arlen, you had a couple of words that came to mind when you thought of our dad, and uh, one word came to mind, and it came right away um, thinking about dad and his life and maybe having to speak today, and uh, the one word is grateful. Um, I came into the Clark family um, about 42 years ago. I've been married to his daughter for 40 years, almost. Next month, month after, it'll be 40 years. And uh, uh, I was greeted with open arms, and uh, I was pretty much clueless in, in a lot of ways, still am in a lot of ways. <laughs> But uh, uh, I, I, I watched Dad, and Dad was my role model for manhood, pretty much everything. Because, like I said, my dad died when I was early, uh, early on. And, uh, and so, so I looked at Dad for a lot of things. And uh, w one thing I remember uh, Dad talking, I love to hear his stories. And his principal uh, told him, told him right out that he was least likely to succeed, that he was never going to amount to anything. I, I just couldn't believe that somebody would tell a kid that, but, but apparently he did. But Dad took that like a springboard and said, I'm going to show him. And, 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 and Dad had a rough start in the beginning, and he told stories uh, of, of his childhood and how rough his dad was on him. And I read one of my students' papers on Monday, and he told a story, uh, a, a quote from Lou Holtz, coach. He said that life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of your response to it. So, so Dad, Dad had a great attitude about adversity. You know, he, he always used it to learn from adversity. And, and, I, and, and so I kind of, I, I, I watched Dad with that, and I loved his stories. And he was successful at some things, and he had some things fail. But he took away the good in the failure, and uh, he dwelled on that. that and that, that's, that's a wonderful attitude to have. And, uh, um, and, and, and so I'm also grateful for our family. Um, I, I, I've experienced love, uh, as much love as, as I've ever known, ever, ever will know. We found it right, right there at home. His model, they, mom and dad took in a lot of people that, that needed help at the time, and, and that model, you know, carried on. We, we, my wife and I have done that, and, and we've had a wonderful uh, life, a lot of laughs. And, and dad always accepted the people that, that we, we adopted some children, and he accepted those kids just as they were his own blood, and, uh, uh, and they sure love him. 
Dad was a wonderful example uh, of family. He was a wonderful example in his service to others. He, uh, he was a, a pillar of, of the churches he attended. He usually rose to leadership. And I'm thankful for that model. Uh, very thankful and grateful. And um, he was very generous. He was always quick to, to pick up the check it, it, when we would go out to lunch or dinner. And honey, how about that first house he bought us? He was a generous guy. That's a family joke. And he bought my last truck, too. He was a generous guy. <laughs> it's all in Texas. But he, he was very generous. And uh, my wife and I often argue, you know, when my crew goes out to dinner, it costs me hundreds to take them out. And, and there was a time or two where I kind of re resented having to buy, pick up the check all the time. But she would say, it's just what we're supposed to do. Dad would have picked up the check. So now I pick up the check. <laughs> Dad loved life. He, toward the end, he, he didn't want to do a whole lot of things. But it, uh, through the years, we did a lot of stuff. We went to conferences and, and workshops. And, and uh, some of them we liked, some of them we didn't like. But, but we usually learned something at, at just about every one of them. And, and as for work, you know, I, he, he used to say, uh, work, uh, 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 plan your work, work your plan. And, and he did. He used to sit in his chair and think about how he'd do what he would do, and, and then he'd go do it. So, so I watched that, and uh, he did a lot of work for us. He built additions. He put roofs on. And I was never really good at that. I just always thought Dad loved that stuff because when I would start a project like plumbing or something, um, uh, he wanted my wife to call him right up so that he could get right over there and, and, and help with that plumbing job. But what was really going on was I was so bad at it that it was a lot easier for him to do it than actually fix the problems that I would make so my wife would call him. I just thought he loved plumbing. I heard a story uh, I read on the plane yesterday coming here about a little boy that uh, he went and spent time uh, with his granddad, and his granddad took him to New York City. And they went, and they saw the Statue of Liberty and, and the Empire State Building, and they gorged themselves on, on New York hot dogs and pizza. And, and they were coming home, and, and the grandfather looked over at his, his grandson, and he thought he was asleep, but he said, Granddad... I sure had a good time today. I sure had fun. Thank you. And the grandfather, you know, that, that's all uh, just, just made his life, basically. And he thought that the little guy dozed back off, but then he said, I hope you don't die soon, because I'd really like to have more fun. <laughs> Dad was my golf partner for a lot of years. He and I would just play together and... Uh, I haven't played much golf since Dad quit playing golf years ago. I, I, I played a few times, but it was, just, it was just never as much fun. And so we've had a good time with Dad, and we had him for a lot of years. And I'm just very grateful for his life and the mark that he's left on me. Thank you. Amen. Anyone else? Here we go, Mike. I spent the last few days thinking about Richard. Got so many memories of, of all kinds of things. But some of the things that, that brings back the memory so much to me Danny Davis was a part of it. Danny introduced me to Richard, actually. Danny and I had some cows together. Big mistake. <laughs> but he brought Richard out, and we were working on some fence. And Danny gave Richard 
a pair of pliers, fence pliers, that was wore out 10 years prior to that project. And I seen Richard over there struggling. I, I didn't know who Richard was. And I saw him over there struggling with these pliers or just struggling with the fence. And I went over there and I said, Richard, what's going? He says, these pliers, and they were bad. I mean, they were wore out. Anybody that knew Danny Davis, they would know that Danny kept everything. But I, I looked at those pliers and I threw them out in the woods as far as I could throw them. Well, Danny, he got all upset with me about that. Went up to the feed store here in the parish and bought a new pair and charged them to me, you know. <laughs> and those things were wore out. But Richard was just, you know, he was just such a, such an inspiration, just like everybody has said. There, there was not a greater man than Richard Clark. He, he was just that kind of guy. One other little short story that included Danny Davis was we used to go to Danny and Duran's house every Sunday night after church and, and, and have a meal or whatever. And, and, the, and the steps walking up to their house was pretty rickety, wasn't they, Ruth Ann? And so, so I got this bright idea, and I called Richard up, and I said, Richard, I said, you know, we ought to go over there and, and, and build some new steps. And he says, well, all right, what, what, is, what do you have in mind? And I said, well, you know, just some nice steps and a little porch area there, you know, for, for Duran and something safe that Ruth Ann, because Ruth Ann almost tripped up there one night. He said, okay, he says, when do you want to do that? And I said, well, man, I don't remember when I said we were going to do it. But anyhow, we made plans. And uh, so Richard, he was going to uh, go over there, and he was going to get Danny, and they were going to go buy the material, and we were going we to work on that porch and build that porch. Well, I never showed up. And Richard never forgave me for that. <laughs> I felt better, though, when you said that he liked working alone, you know. <laughs> This first time in years I felt better about that. <laughs> but he, <laughs> you know, something, and he never forgave, he always brought that up to me, you know. Not, yeah, well, what kind of project you want to do now, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he was a great, great man. Just a great man and loved God and loved people. And what was the, what was the bracelet that, that Richard had for years uh, what would Jesus do? Have me do. That's it. That was, that was good. So God bless you, man. God bless you guys. Amen. Anyone else? We don't want to cut anyone short. Okay. You all don't know me, but I'm a friend of Teresa and Rick. And unfortunately, I, I wasn't, uh, I personally didn't know Richard, but I knew him through Teresa and Rick's eyes. When Teresa would talk about him, her eyes would light up and they would just have this glow and she just adored him. And Richard had to have been a really special man because he raised an incredible son and how his son treated treats his wife and his friends and me I mean they, they've made me feel like family and and you have to give Richard a lot of that credit for instilling that in his family right. so I, I didn't have the honor of meeting Richard but I was blessed to have met Rick and Teresa bless you Oh, no, no.
Anyone else? I don't need a microphone because I'm Okay. Anyway, we were married 68 years. I was only 10 when I got married. <laughs> but I had been kind of a, well, as Charlie Carver always called me a butterfly, but I flittered around a lot. But, okay, so when we got married, we had quite a large wedding in that, but my mother wouldn't buy the wedding pictures for herself because she knew it wasn't going to last more than six months. She knew her daughter. <laughs> I had the reputation of that. But anyway, we were married six, 68 years, and the Lord blessed us mightily with a beautiful family and a beautiful church family and many friends that we left up north too. So it's, we were just so blessed so much and I am so grateful to God for what he did for us. Well, I think it's fitting that Sister Ruth Ann would speak last. Having known him best, the Bible says we become husband and wife, become one flesh. And I know that flesh has been rent, but the Holy Spirit is with us. Amen. Amen. We're going to do one more song. The title of it is Amazing Grace. You may have heard it. The anthem of the church. Please sing it with us. Amazing Grace. Pastor Rick. Jesus was born, oh, now. 
In honor of Brother Rick, there will be a dinner next door, and you're all invited to come next door and share a, a meal together. I know it would be something that he would enjoy. He always liked to break bread, and uh, like I said, we went out many, many a night with Ruth Ann and Richard and shared a meal together, and he was quick to pick up the check. <laughs> Amen. So let's pray and be dismissed, and once again, thank you for being here. I know it means the world to the family and, and to Rick. It would, have been a, it would have been pleased. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, it's hard to put a life into context sometimes. A life that was lived, not just lived, but lived right. A man that cared about righteousness. He cared about being a father, a husband, a brother, a co-worker. So many things that he was... He was intent on doing right, and we thank you for that example. And we pray, Lord, as we leave here today that you will keep us safe. As we travel to go next door, we just pray that you would bless all those who prepared this food for us. Bless those, Lord Jesus, whose hands have worked so tirelessly for hours and hours. I've watched them preparing this, Lord, and bless the food and nourish it to our bodies and the fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. We can meet next door. And the family will eat first. Okay? Amen. Please, please let the family go first. Amen. Consider yourself dismissed.